Welcome to the, my presentation on training state-of-the-art text embedding and neural search models at the Milan NLP Group. Check out their work on contextualized topic models. It's a really nice application of dense uh, embedding models. I'm Niels. I work as research scientist for Hugging Face, and I'm the maintainer of sentence transformers. In this talk, uh, I will first give a short introduction on why, uh, why are dense vector spaces and representation interesting. Then I will talk um, how to train these models, especially I will go into a lot of detail how to train state-of-the-art models and what are the tricks to get really good models. Then I will give a short overview of our multilingual models. I will present different neural search architectures besides these uh, models. And then I will talk about zero-shot information retrieval benchmarking. So why dense representations for text? So traditionally, we used in text a sparse lexical representation, also known as bag of words. So each word has its own dimension. If you have the sentence, how are you? Then every word is encoded at one position. So here at this position, we encode there's a how, an R, and a U in the text. This has several issues. The first is the lexical gap. So US, USA, and United States, these are three different dimensions in the vector space. Sometimes you have big words, apple, the fruit, and apple, the company. They are at the same position in this time and in this vector. You have the same distance between all words. So the distance between US, uh, US and USA is the same as US and apple. And the word order is not preserved in such a representation. A dense representation, if you define it formally, is quite easy. You have some function where you take as an input the text and you map it to some n-dimensional vector space and you call the dimension n uh, your embedding. Usually you use quite small dimension between 100 and 1000 dimensions. Now the interesting task is to find such a function that semantically similar text is closed. However, what is semantically similar? First, there cannot be a universal text representation. So for example, if we take these two texts like nuclear energy is safe and nuclear energy is dangerous, should they be close in the vector space? Should they be semantically similar because both are talking about nuclear energy? Or should they be far away distant in the vector space because they express an opposing views? This depends on your task. And so hence you need a task specific model. Applications for these dense vector spaces are manifold. First application is clustering, also your uh, topic modeling where you put your text in the vector space and then you look for clusters in this vector space. Other nice applications by text mining. So you have a large text in English and a large text in German, for example, and you want to find parallel sentences, which you can then use, for example, to train machine, uh, neural machine translation systems. Big application is also search. You have all your documents embedded in the vector space and then the user inputs some query or some question it's also embedded in the vector space. And then you, you check in the vector space, which is the closest document. And that should be a relevant document. It's not limited to text. Uh, you can also embed images and text in that same vector space. So here you have an image. And then here you have the text, two dogs in the snow. And then you can search. So when you enter this text, this image will show up. And it's, of course, also not limited to English or only one language. So you can have a text encoder for many languages. So independent which type of text you input, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Chinese. Um, if you input two dogs in the snow, it will show you this nice picture of the two dogs. You can also use it for our zero-shot image classification. So you define your labels as text strings. So here you have the label cat, dog, London at day, and London at night. You encode the text in the vector space. And then when a new image arrives, you check what is the closest text. And then this is the, the, the label for the image. Now I will talk about how to train embedding models. This will go a lot into details how to train state-of-the-art models. So first question, can we just average BERT? And the question is no. So if we take bird based uncased and we just average it performs worse than averaging standard word embeddings like love. 
However, then you can improve it. So if you look at the best unsupervised method on bird large, um, it achieves a performance of 60, uh, averaged across 14 data sets. And as soon as you add some training data, so for example, if you train NLI data, the performance improves. And if you add large training data, the performance improves quite significantly. So out of the box, an unsupervised approach sadly do not work that well. Labeled and structured data is quite important. When you train models, it's important to think about the global and the local structure of the vector space. So the global structure is the relation of two random sentences, and the local structure is the relation between two similar sentences. And it's important that you use a loss function that optimizes both local and global structure. So here on the left, you have an example of a bad global structure. So we have different questions, for example, from Stack Overflow on Python, on PHP, Java, and C++. And maybe you just train it with triplet loss where you have an anchor and a positive and a negative, which are all three Python questions. And the, the structure for the Python vector space maybe looks nice, but it overlaps with the PHP vector space and the Java vector space. So here the, the closest, most similar question to this Python question would be three PHP questions. Nice uh, vector space with the global and local structure would be here on the right. So where we have like the different questions on PHP, Python, Java, and C++ in different corners of the vector space. And the local structure would be here, the relation between these. So are these really the two most similar Python questions or not? Nice loss function is the multiple negative ranking loss. It's quite easy to train with this, and it's quite also quite easy to get training data for this loss. What you need are just positive pairs. So you have, for example, a question and the an, an answer, or you have some image and an image caption, or you take the paper title and the paper abstract. And your intention is that this pair should be close. So you want to have the paper title and the paper abstract close in the vector space, or you want to have the image and the image caption close in the vector space. Which, so if we encode this now in the vector space, so here we put our anchor and here the belonging positive. We want this to, to be close in the vector space. And all other positives in the same batch, we want to have it distant from the anchor. And the intuition is that if you select randomly two questions, it's quite unlikely that they are similar. So they will be on completely different topics. And yeah, you, you should compute this loss using cross entropy. So here we have the mathematical definition. So you compute the similarity between the anchor and the positive, and then you divide it by the sum over the similarity of the anchor and all other positives. And for the similarity function, you can either take a cosine similarity or dot product. So here an intuitive explanation for this loss. So we have the question, how many people live in Berlin? And then we have three uh, candidates, three positives. Uh, the first one is the correct answer to this question around three and a half million people live in Berlin. The second one is Washington DC is the capital of the US. And the third one, the 2021 Olympics are held in Japan. And then you compute the text embeddings and compute the similarities. So for example, between A1 and P1, we have 0.5, A1 and P2 is 0.3, and then A1 and P3 is 0.1. And so this is your prediction, these three scores. And the gold score is the correct. The first one is correct, and the two others are incorrect. So you have this as a prediction, this as the gold label, and then you apply uh, a standard cross entropy loss. However, you don't do it in a batch not with uh, one question to one answer, but you have a lot of questions and a lot of belonging answers. So here we have the question, how many people live in Berlin with the answer? What is the capital of the US with the answer? And where are the Olympics this year with the uh, respective answer? And then you compute for all the questions, for all the anchors and all the positives, the embeddings. <clears throat> you create a large matrix of all the similarities of all the pairwise similarities. And then you have a label uh, defined like this. So for the first question, the first answer is correct. For the second question, the second. And for the third question, the third question is correct. You, and then you just do back propagation based on between this prediction and this code label. 
So I said there's like a similarity function involved. Um, so A and B are vectors and there are different options for the similarity function. One possible similarity function is the dot product where you just compute the dot product between A and B. The other is the cosine similarity where we, you just first normalize the vectors to uh, size one and then you compute the dot product. Um, this does not work so well because the score differences are too small. So if you want to work with cosine similarity, what you do is you use a scaled cosine similarity. So you compute the cosine similarity and multiply it by some constant factor, for example, value of 20 works quite well. And you can also do it for dot product, but this is not as necessary for dot product. So what should you use? Should you use cosine similarity or should you use dot product? Um, it depends on your task. So cosine similarity, here the vector has the highest similarity to itself. So if you compute the cosine similarity of A and A, it's always one, it's always the highest similarity. For dot product, this is not necessary. So there can be some other vector where dot product of A and B is higher than the dot product of A and A. If you normalize the vectors, then the cosine similarity is equal to the dot product and every vector has a length one. And with normalized vectors, um, the cosine similarity is proportional to Euclidean distance. So if you work with k-means clustering, for example, um, this works quite well. For the dot product, you cannot use the k-means clustering. You cannot use Euclidean distance. And also the dot product vectors, um, there you do not know what is the maximum vector length. And some approximate nearest neighbor methods can be slower um, when you have not normalized vectors, but this depends on your uh, approximate nearest neighbor method. Further, there's a difference um, on, the, on, on what type of data these models prefer. So here on the top, we see um, a model which was trained with cosine similarity. And here it's retrieving given a question, uh, papers from track COVID on COVID-19 scientific literature. And at the bottom, we have a model which was trained with dot product, and we see the frequency of the hits. And what we see here, oh, and on the x-axis, we have the length of the hit. What we see for the cosine similarity model is that it prefers to retrieve shorter documents. And for the dot product, it prefers to retrieve longer documents. So because a longer passage, so for a dot product, it's, the vectors are not normalized. So the um, a longer passage creates a longer vector, which leads to a higher dot product. Sometimes interesting when you use a model with cosine similarity, as mentioned, the similarity, um, the high similarity has the, the input itself. So you input some question to the system and then the system retrieves the same question as an answer. So this is something you do not usually want. How to improve the quality. The most simple trick is to just increase your batch size. So um, if you increase the batch size, the task gets more difficult and you get better results. So here at the bottom, we see the batch size starting at 128, going up to 16,000. And here we see the performance on MS Marco data set. And as we increase the batch size, performance gets better and better. And this is quite intuitive. So assume you have a multiple choice um, test there you have some question and then you have 10 possi uh, possible answers. It's quite okay to, to find the correct answer out of this, but if you have a question and 1000 possible answers, it's a lot harder to find out of these 1000 answers the correct answer. The other trick which leads to quite a significant improvement is to use hard negatives, which is here the red line. As you can see with the same batch size, we get quite a boost in performance. Uh, I will talk about hard negatives in a minute. Um, so how can we improve the quality? Um, one way is to work with better batches. So assume you have question answer pairs from Stack Exchange. They are like up to like a lot of different, 140 different subforums, Stack Overflow, Travel, Cooking, Math, Physics, Chemistry. And one naive approach is that you randomly sample data from all pairs. So you have a question from Python and an answer from Python. You have a question about traveling Weezer and an answer. And you have a question about pasta, how to cook pasta. 
And here finding the right answer for a given question is quite easy. So your, your question is about Python. So you take the one programming answer in the batch. A better approach would be to sample pairs from one subforum, for example, from Stack Overflow. So instead of having random questions, you have always programming questions in this batch. So you have a question about Python, Java, and C. Now it gets harder to find the correct answer. However, adding random batches might still be needed. As I said in the beginning, we have to optimize the local structure and the global structure. So if you um, just train it like this, so you have um, batches from Stack Overflow and then batches from math, might be that Stack Overflow and math and travel and cooking questions overlap. And then the, the closest answer to a Python question is actually some question from um, how, how to cook pasta. The other strategy to improve the quality is to use negatives, hard negatives. So instead of having pairs, you train with triplets. So here you have the, the anchor, you have the positive and the negative. And the negative, it should be similar to the positive, but it should not match with the anchor. So to start with a bad example, the anchor is a question, how many people live in London? positive would be around 9 million people live in London, and the negative would be London has a population of 9 million people. This would be a bad triplet um, because actually the positive and the negative are both relevant for the question, so a human would be satisfied with both answers. But by the training, we put, would push the model if it puts n close to a. So a good example would be the following when you have as negative around 1 million people live in Birmingham, second to London. So it also talks about people who live somewhere in a city in UK. It also talks about London, but it does not provide the answer uh, how many people live in London. So if you return this as an answer to a user, the user would not be happy because the question is not answered for the user. The quality of the hard negative significantly improves the performance. Um, so this is like really a key point you can work on to make the hard negatives better. And finding these good hard negatives is not so easy. Uh, strategy one, you can exploit some structure in your data. So for example, in the citation graph, you can say you have a title, then you have the set paper where you say, okay, the title and the cited paper, it should be close. And then you take a paper, which is two hops away. You take the paper cited by the cited paper. And your intuition is that this paper is not, not as relevant as the cited paper directly. Or when you look at Q&A, you can take a question, you can take an answer with many stars and an answer with few stars. The other strategy is to mine, uh, mine hard negative, the more common strategy. Um, for example, you can use BM25 to find the top most similar documents to the anchor or the positive, and then you select one of these randomly. The issue with BM25 negatives is that they are not necessarily hard negatives. So here we have as a red star the, the query. And here in the vector space, we would consider them as relevant. And here the orange one, these are the BM25 negatives. And they might be on a lexical level really similar to the query or the positive, but they are in for the vector space, for the dense vector space, not. Uh, not really close. So for the dense vector space here, the blue triangles, they would be the hard, uh, the, the hard negatives. They're really close in the vector space to our query and they are not relevant. So finding these, or when you do mining of these hard negatives, uh, you run into the problem that you do not know if they are really negative or not. So for example, the MS Marco data sets, which is a popular data set for uh, information retrieval, there you have a sparse annotation. You have some questions, some query given, and only one document is annotated as relevant. However, the corpus is quite large with nearly 9 million passages. So there are a lot of duplicates and near duplicates. And actually it has recently been shown that model retrieve for roughly 60% of the query better answers than the labeled answer. So if you do this hard negative mining in the vector space, you will get a lot of these bad triplets where the negative is actually more relevant to the query than the labeled positive. So what's extremely important is to do um, denoising. 
So you, you first train your embedding model, then you find the close points in the vector space. So you find all the points here in the vector space, which are close to the query. And then you do denoising. Uh, de so you filter out the bad ones and only keep the good ones. And then you continue training with the new hard negatives. You do the denoising with the cross encoder. So what is a cross encoder? So by encoder, where here we input the text independently to Word, we get some vectors which we compare with cosine similarity. For cross encoder, we input the two text, the query and the passage or sentence A and sentence B to BERT, where it performs cross attention between all the tokens in the input A and all the tokens in input B. And at the end, we have some classifier which outputs a score between zero and one, how relevant um, is the pair. Mm -hmm. The big advantage of a cross encoder is that it's a lot more powerful. So here we train a cross encoder and a bi encoder on the STS task. And we see that the cross encoder performs a lot better. And especially when you have small data sets, we see quite good performance for cross encoders on small data sets, while bi encoders do not perform well when you have small data sets. So, how does the complete training pipeline look like? So, you start with some training data. You use this training data to train your bi-encoder. You use it to train your cross-encoder. Then with the bi-encoder, you mine close points in the vector space. So you take all the queries and you look what are the closest points in the vector space. You classify them with the cross-encoder. So you take the query and input the query and the point in the vector space and then ask, classify uh, the cross-encoder as it relevant or not. And you take some threshold when you say, okay, the, the cross encoder produces a score below 0.1, for example, then I think this is actually a negative, and then you only take this negative. So this has quite a big impact. So here again on the MS Marco data set, when you train with random negatives, you get a performance of 26. When you add BM25, you get a performance of 29. When you mine hard negatives without this denoising step with the cross encoder, performance actually drops. So it's even worse than random negatives. But when you do the denoising, so if you filter out these bad negatives and only have good negatives, uh, performance improves quite a lot. A different loss function, which I started to like a lot recently, uh, um, proposed by Sebastian Hofstetter, is the margin MSE loss. So in the previous step, we had the issue, which threshold should I use for the cross encoder? If I choose like a really small threshold for the cross encoder and say I just keep pairs with a score below 0 0.01, then the negatives are too easy. If you take a threshold too large, so you take all the, all the mined passages with a cross encoder score larger than, I don't know, up, up to 0 0.8. And it can happen that the negative might be quite relevant for the question. And the larger the threshold, uh, the worse or the more frequent are these bad triplets. So the match in MSE loss gets rid of this. So the idea is that you want to have the embedding should have the same distance at the cross encoder scores. So you take the cross encoder, you compute the cross encoder score for the query and the positive and the query and the negative, and then you compute the distance. So what's the distance between this pair and this pair? And then you compute the distance for the bi encoder. So you compute the embedding for the query and the positive and compute the dot product. And then you compute the dot product between the query and the negative, and you want to have this distance. So the distance between the cross encoder and the distance between the bi encoder uh, equally. So the nice thing about this loss is that there's no threshold needed. So it does not matter if the negative is actually negative. So it can also be a positive. When it's also relevant to the query, the cross encoder score will be small. So in the vector space, you want to have the models, um, um, want to have the points also close in the vector space. If the point is like really bad, so if the, the negative uh, is, is really bad, a bad, passage for the question, then the cross encoder will have large distance. And you want also have that far away in the vector space. And for the margin MSE, the harder the negative, the better the performance. So it's here really you can just look at, okay, what are the hardest points? What are the closest points to, to my query? 
classify them with the cross encoder and your performance improves. So the final um, state of the art approach to train models is the following. You take your training data, you train a bi-encoder with multiple negative ranking loss and you train the cross encoder. Then you mine the closed points with the bi-encoder. So for every query, you look what are the closest points in my vector space. You classify them with the cross encoder and then you train your bi-encoder on with margin MSE loss. So here we see the results on MS Marco when we train with random negatives and BM25 negatives with performance of 26 and 29. If we add multiple next ranking loss and denoised hard negative, we get up to 34. And if we do margin MSE loss, we get another big improvement in performance. So far, I've mainly talked about training procedure. Um, and in academia, we also love to work on training procedures and thinking about more complex and advanced procedures, um, how to train these models. However, what's more effective in many settings is to work on the training data. So here we have, um, the, we have a training set in this Marco, which has around 500,000 pairs. And we train it with a simple method and we compared in domain on track deep learning 2019 and 2020, which labeled data on um, MS Marco. And we also test the performance out of domain for other uh, tasks. And we see when we add, when we spend a lot of time to create this sophisticated training method, we can get some improvement in domain and also some uh, improvement out of domain. However, what you can also do is to work on the training data. So we recently did it. We compiled a large set uh, of like 200 million pairs, question answer pairs from a lot of different sources. We used an extremely simple training procedure without any hard negatives, just question answer with random in batch negatives. In domain on MS Marco, we got a slight improvement, but we got a lot, big improvement out of domain, like 10 point improvement out of domain. So if you're just interested to get the best model, my advice is to, to work on the data side, get more and better data. And this helps a lot more than to tune the, all the knobs of your training procedure. Now I want to present quickly um, a way how to make models multilingual. The issue that we have is that we have a lot of training data in English, but sadly not so far well-structured data for other languages. One strategy to, to make models multilingual is to use multilingual knowledge distillation, which I presented last year. So you have some English teacher model, so for example, trained on MS Marco, and you have some parallel data from machine translation. So you have a text in English and a text in German. You pass the English text to the English teacher model, which produces some sentence vector. You pass the English and the German text to the student model, which produces an English vector and a German vector for the two inputs. And then you say, okay, I want to have the English vector for my student close to the teacher vector in the vector space. And I want also to have the German vector close to the English teacher vector in the vector space. And you, you train the student model um, using uh, mean spread error loss. Uh, you pass a, a lot of different uh, parallel data you have on your, on your language. And then at the end, you get a student model which behaves like the teacher model, but which understands a lot of different languages. And it's not limited to languages, but you can easily train it on like 50 different or 100 different languages. So far, um, there's a lot of hype on neural retrieval, but there's like a really big downside. It's like, it's extremely data hungry. So as we've seen, the MS Marco data set has like 500,000 annotated pairs. And getting such large training sets is often only suitable for big companies or if you already have a popular product. So if you have run the Google search, it's quite easy to get user interactions, thousands of user interactions every second. But new, com uh, new companies, academics, and also niche use cases are left out. So if you have run a tiny website on a specialized topic, it's really hard to get such a big data set. 
So I ask my research, like first, how well do models generalize to new domains and tasks? So can I just train it on some existing data sets and will it perform well on my special case? And how to improve the performance from undated data? As part of this, we created be a benchmarking IR, uh, where we carefully selected 18 different data sets from nine different tasks on information retrieval on really different, um, different areas. So for example, we have news retrieval where we want to retrieve news websites, or we have, for example, tweet retrieval where the input is a news article and we want to find tweets. Um, and talking about this news event, we have from argument retrieval where we input some, some argument and we want to find some counter um, arguments and many more of these data sets. And then we evaluated different um, uh, architectures for doing neural search. The one were on bioencoders on these dense vector spaces I talked about. The other is based on cross encoders. So the cross encoders, as mentioned previously, we input the query and we input the document. And then we perform cross attention between all the query tokens and all the document tokens. And at the end, we get some score at, at the output. The other architecture, which I quite like is Dr. Query. As an input, you have the document, and then you have a sequence to sequence system. Uh, for example, a BART system or a T5 system. And the T5 system generates queries, questions people could ask about this document and this document could answer. So you input your document and then it spits out a long list of questions, potential questions, which can be um, asked, uh, which could be asked or people could ask about this document. And then you simply concatenate these two, the document and the generated questions. You index this in your favorite search engine, Lucene, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, whatever lexical search engine use. And then you have just a user query as an input and it retrieves nicer, better documents and can also reduce the gap from, from the lexical gap. The next model I want, would like to highlight is Colbert. So by encoder, they were producing one embedding for the query and one embedding for the document. In Colbert, we are producing many embeddings for the query and many embeddings for the documents for every token one. And then we compute compute the similarity between every uh, query token embedding and every document token embedding. And then we summarize it to a final score. So on our Beer benchmark data set, we checked how well do models generalize. And we compared to like a lexical search BN25 baseline. And we see on how many data sets is the performance, does the performance increase and how often does it decrease? And we see um, the best performance is with the cross encoder. Here we see a consistent improvement and also a strong improvement on most of the data sets. Also doc T5 query and Colbert performs nice, but even for Colbert on nine data sets, we see an improvement. On nine data sets, it performs worse than simple lexical search. And test B, that's the first by encoder. Here we see it just improves on eight data sets, but on nine data sets, does not work well. So it has issues to generalize to new domains and new tasks. <clears throat> In principle, benchmarking, information retrieval benchmarking is difficult. So only a tiny fraction of query and document pairs are annotated. And we assume that all other pairs are irrelevant. And for the annotation, you have to use some annotation pool. So you have some query, then you search in your document collection what could be potentially relevant documents to show it to your human and they annotate it. And often uh, people use lexical models for this. So they input the query in the lexical search, they got documents and then they annotate, is it relevant or not? And we tested for one data set, the track COVID data set, how many unannotated documents are systems retrieving. This is also known as whole at 10 rate. So for example, for lexical search BM25, 6% of the top 10 results were never seen by an annotator. We do not know if they're relevant or not. And we assume by default that they are not relevant. And we see quite big differences. So if we do 
BM25 plus cross encoder re-ranking, we have like a really small hole at 10 rate, just 1.6% of the hits have never been seen by an annotator. If we take, for example, the DPR model, 30% uh, of the hits have never been seen by the annotator and is assumed to be irrelevant. What we did, we um, took all the unannotated documents, we showed it uh, to, to annotators and asked if they are relevant or not. And then we computed first the scores before with the holds and then the scores after the holds. And here the results changed. So for example, if we take the original benchmark and we test the buy encoder NC from Microsoft, <clears throat> We see it performs worse than lexical search BM25. However, if you add the missing 14% um, of the annotation, we see quite a big improvement and it performs better than lexical search. So in summary, um, benchmarking and information retrieval is really complex and we need better data sets and constantly evolving data sets, which take into account new approaches we have. So in summary, New research has issues to generalize. So in principle, more data is helpful. So train it on larger, more diverse data sets, and also compute intensive models are better than fast and efficient models. Knowledge distillation across architectures is powerful. So we can use the, the cross encoder to learn uh, the bi encoder, and the bi encoder can improve quite a lot by this. And in multilingual models, so far we're heavily dependent on data from machine translation. What's missing is authentic training data. So people in Japan, they ask different questions than people in the US. So the MS Marco data sets, it's US centric. It has a lot of questions how to do your tax and how to do tax reimbursement in the US. But I doubt that people in Italy or people in Japan will, would ask the same question about the US tax system. So what are the biggest challenges in neural search? For me, the biggest challenge is how to update the knowledge in our models. So BERT, the BERT model, um, for example, has no idea about COVID-19. It has no idea about BERT. It has no idea about the company Zeta Alpha. <clears throat> and also BERT thinks that uh, Obama is the current US president. So it did not update the knowledge to, to Trump. and has absolutely no idea that Joe Biden is now the US president. Also, what's interesting is low resource learning. Um, so far, we, we train the models on 100,000 or millions, billions of data points, but how do we reduce the need for labeled data? And also what's interesting is to train models for languages other than English. Um, getting the authentic training data, this is quite a big challenge. Also, uh, generalizability is a big challenge. So the compute intensive approaches, for example, uh, the cross encoder and covert, they generalize better, but they are really, really slow and impractical. So the big question is like how to make approaches more efficient um, that also can generalize well to unknown and unseen domains. Thank you for listening. <laughs>